Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Hashtag Real Talk with me, your host, Aaron Bregg, or the commonly, more commonly known is your guide to the crazy world that is information security. Today's special guest, I'm going to have him introduce himself real quick, but I want to talk about the topic because the topic is super important to me as a former web developer. So the topic is going to be rethinking penetration testing. It's more, or sorry, attack surface management. It's just more than pen testing. So I'm going to be quiet for a minute and let my awesome guest introduce himself. How did you get into the wonderful world that is information security? Hey, Aaron, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be on your show. So, you know, to introduce myself to your audience, I'm Nabil Hanan. I work as the field CISO for a company called NetSpy. We are a leader in offensive security testing. And, you know, like many people who've got into security, I got into it by accident. And the accident started when I was seven years old, where I, my parents got me a computer, I took it apart, and I didn't know how to put it back together. But it was my curiosity of trying to figure out how does the things that happen on the screen, how do they manifest themselves from this little box that you're connecting the screen to? And, you know, I was seven years old, wanted to figure it out, obviously took it apart, couldn't put it back together. I think I had a ban on using the computer for a year from my parents <laughs> until I was allowed to use it again. But um, I got into technology very early. I loved to figure out how things work. And... I had a family friend who actually started teaching me how to write code and how to program. He was a computer science student in university. I was seven to eight years old. So he would come spend time at our home, but he would also teach me how to code because that's what he was into. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I've been programming since I was seven, you know, writing. But back then, programming for me was really copying and pasting code from a book into a compiler and running it. I didn't really know much about what was going on. Then I really dived into uh, the, the software space in high school, where I realized that I have a really good knack of solving problems, whether it be in mathematical problems, physics problems, and just problem solving in and, and making things work in bite-sized pieces so that I could give instructions to a computer to solve the problem for me. And that's where I really enhanced my uh, my capabilities from a programming perspective, uh, went to university to study computer science and um, worked as a product manager and a software developer right after university. I was a product manager for BlackBerry. Uh, back then it was known as Research in Motion. Uh, wow, that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Yeah, blast from the past. So I was a product manager for the BlackBerry Messenger, I actually helped do the re-architecture of the platform to, to take it from BlackBerry only to multi-platform multi, uh, support. And then um, I got a call from a small boutique consulting company called Sigital, uh, who wanted to hire me to do cybersecurity work. And I knew I always had interest in cybersecurity. I wanted to get into cybersecurity couldn't give up this opportunity. Literally, I had an offer. Within a week, I moved countries. I moved from Canada to the US and uh, started my my journey officially in the cybersecurity space. Awesome. That is, I, I like hearing stories because I, I was also one of those people that didn't come in through the traditional means. But all right, we got some good things to cover. I want to be mindful of our time to make sure we get them. So as a former developer and a security person, you know, I think of, you know, I think of pen testing a little more myopically, right? Like I'm like, hey, I want to, I work with my development teams. We have our secure software development life cycle. I want to do X, Y, and Z. And sometimes I think even for myself, I put blinders on when it comes to stuff like attack surface management. Do you want to talk about a big level, like to, to even me, right? To pick on me a little bit. What are the bis, biggest mixed conceptions when it comes to like attack service management and pen testing? I think often people start thinking about the scope of the problem that we're trying to solve with attack surface management or just cybersecurity in general, they think of it too narrowly. So as you mentioned, since you have a development background, 
and you're thinking of your secure SDLC, maybe you're doing static analysis, code review, dynamic analysis, maybe some composition analysis, maybe some pen testing, you know, from your perspective, you're thinking, hey, I've done all the right things, my system should be secure. But the challenge you have with cybersecurity is that the implications of what you're doing is so broad, and there are so many other components that are involved when it comes to securing your ecosystem, especially things that you're putting external facing on your perimeter that is visible to the internet. Minor things can have pretty far-reaching impact and consequences from a security perspective. So you may have done code review and you may have followed your SDLC perfectly and done all the things that you're supposed to do, checked all the boxes, but then the person deploying the piece of software may have misconfigured, I don't know, the S3 bucket or the database and, and all of a sudden made it public to the internet. So all of your other efforts kind of go wasted if you're not doing everything properly and understanding what your perimeter looks like at all times. Changes can happen regularly. You know, we're we're in a time and age where software development development happens really rapidly. You know, you've heard of the term CICD, the continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. The whole concept is you should be able to automate and make releases and bite sizes as quickly as possible to help your customer or help your business accomplish certain objectives. Now, Isn't, didn't mean yeah. to interrupt, but I'm, since you live in this space more than, more than I do, did I hear something like Netflix rolls out code like every hour or something like that now? Like, it's just insane. Yeah, there's a story about that, that Netflix, Amazon, and all, a lot of the big tech companies, Google, right, Facebook, Meta, et cetera, they are releasing code maybe hourly or maybe more than once an hour. And as they build feature and functionality and push updates, it can go all the way from the developer's laptop where the code gets created to production in a very rapid fashion. And that's because they are building a process where they, instead of having really large gates or road roadblocks for big security activities, they're having many hundreds or thousands of very little roadblocks that the software can process through at all phases of the life cycle. And they're building secure development frameworks that developers must adopt so that, you know, if they're taking the onus of creating security problems away from the developer. So developers, even if they wanted to, <laughs> If they don't use the feature functionality in the library and framework correctly, they're not able to introduce security vulnerabilities, which allows them to now move and release software at a faster cadence than they were able to before. So as you can imagine, if their attack surface and code and perimeter is changing so rapidly, it's very easy to miss something. And that's where attack surface management really comes into play. It's a solution that is monitoring your external facing perimeter 24 seven, 365 days a year and looking for any vulnerabilities that have a high enough impact that an attacker could see from the outside as well. And we're able to use our solution to detect them faster and notify you so you can address them uh, timely. Is you bring up a good point because yes, I mean, I, I know that I need to rethink these, right? Like that's why my boss has us, we're about to do like a secure development 2.0 project this fall, right? Like we need to rethink some of this stuff because even the, even the advice that we've given, and some of the tools that we use from a couple of years ago aren't aren't even this aren't even managed the same, right? Like especially when you think about static application scanning. Do you think one of the mis one of the other misconceptions goes around the fact that this is a you know like fire and forget, so to speak? So okay, hey, I did I did SAST, I did DAST. I had a quick overview by your internal pen testing team. It's out there. Okay. Until a new vulnerability comes up, I don't have to worry about that. Is there, is that also part of the problem? So thinking like maybe five software development four or five years ago, 
that is kind of how we did things because to your point, we were doing not so many releases in such a short amount of time. Yeah, I've I've been recently on a on a health binge trying to improve my personal health and I've been using this health analogy to to talk about that exact scenario that you mentioned there. If you think about your, you know, your, if you try if you're trying to get healthier and and you want to improve the quality of life you have and your overall health and hygiene, you need to make a habit of doing certain things on a regular basis. And it's all about the consistency and discipline of doing it correctly every single time that it's applicable. So if I decide to have a salad today and then I don't have a salad again and I have fried chicken for the rest of the year, I'm not getting healthier by having salad once in a year. Similar concept to static analysis, pen testing, dynamic testing, et cetera. You have to build it as part of your genome of doing software development. It has to be ingrained into the life cycle. It has to be part of your feature functionality that you're implementing. That is an inherent component of the software. If you think of the qualities of a software, and I called, I, I like to call them the illities, right? Reusability, <laughs> availability, and all of those. That's I good. Think I like that. Security needs like to that. be one of the illities, right? So it needs to be security illity, or I don't know what it is. I'll let marketing people come up with a better term. But <laughs> but from the quality perspective, security is a subset of the quality illity. Uh, yeah. So. Um, you have to make it an inherent component of any software that you're building. And, and that's the challenge we have today. I feel like often people don't realize the importance of making sure that security is just an inherent property of the software that you're building. So recently, like as we're having some of these planning discussions on how we're going to do it, I will say, and this is, Funny, because you're going to be near and dear, of course, a pen tester thought about this. You know, we talked initially about, hey, you know, four years ago, we thought about the tools we wanted to bring in, we being security, right? You know, this is, you know, check marks, you know, insert what vendor name for, you know, static application scanning. So, you know, we made that decision, dynamic application scanning, right? Like we made the decision on solution. And then we kind of shoehorned it into the process with minimum success, right? For a variety of reasons. One, you know, it we we you know we were we did a plug and play and then forget it for a little bit, right? Because it's security, something else happened, and then you forget, oh man, it's been a few months since I went back and checked on that kid. I better go in or pet, right? You and I were talking pets in the podcast prep session. Like, you know, I, man, I need to go check on that cat to make sure it's still got food. Um and it with different you know degrees of success. So our lead pen tester said, okay, you know what? Let's do something different this time. You know, let's partner with development in such a way to maybe do we need to let development actually select the product because that way you have their buy-in, right? Because, you know, in our system, you know, we're a medium, you know, we're a larger healthcare organization now, and we have a pretty decent internal development house, but we're still in the, we don't have the development resources like, you know, say Netflix or Meta, like you talked about. Is this that fundamental change that we need? Do you think we need to have more thinking like this to, to, to make successful inroads in attack surface management? I think that the problem you're highlighting is a little different from the attack surface management uh, problem, which is looking at your attack surface outside in and, and trying to figure out what's being exposed, but more from an inherent software development challenge that you have, which is where there really isn't a one size fits all solution. You know, one static analysis tool may work better on a certain language versus another language or a certain framework versus another framework. Yes, so, to everything you're saying. <laughs> so, so trying to shoehorn one solution that must be mandatory and adopted across the board is very challenging, especially for an, an organization that has a meaningful size of software portfolio that is trying to manage. 
the the way I think of the SDLC and penetration testing is that you need to build gates and checks within your secure SDLC and then leverage things like pen testing to detect the efficacy and the effectiveness of those controls. Oh, so don't treat pen okay. testing as a way to discover problems. Use other techniques within your SDLC to discover problems, right? You might have an IDE plugin that I'm looks writing for it down, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, good thing we're recording too, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, you can have IDE plugins as an example that a developer uses. And just like when you use Microsoft Word, their spell check, when you're writing software, the IDE plugin could maybe detect vulnerabilities and you fix them right away in line as you're developing. Another control may be you have a CI CD pipeline that integrates SAST, DAST, IAST, SCA, and other products that are looking for certain things in a meaningful way and giving immediate feedback to your developers as they commit code on issues that they're creating so they can fix that in real time. You might have certain test automation scripts that you can help your QA team develop that are almost as easy as functional tests, but the QA team can now also be an extension of your security team. And they can do basic things like input validation check or edge, edge and boundary test cases and make it part of their regular hygiene and workflow of what they're building. And then what you do is you use a major gate like a pen test to see how effective all those controls are. Because if all those controls you have are working effectively, by the time you get to the pen test, it should be just like a toll gate that makes sure you have the little easy pass and lets you through versus it actually trying to check and look up who you are, look up your car, determine if it's valid or not, and whether you've paid your, your tolls in the past or not, et cetera, right? So you make a fast lane for your development teams. So in a sense, trying to shoehorn one, one solution obviously does not make sense, but if you enable your development teams with things like different types of tooling that's applicable to them, things like reusable libraries and software components that have already been vetted for security, or maybe they're even built with security in mind, like they're built to provide you with security functionality that's been approved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those type of things can allow them to now get on the fast lane of their development lifecycle and pass through that gate at a much faster pace and not have to worry about, you know, a big pen test or a big manual code review or the security team coming and laying down the hammer that uh, they have to get something done because they have a big vulnerability in there. That's how it really needs to be handled versus the traditional thinking of I'm going to buy one tool and that's going to solve my problem because we have we should learn by now that there's no such thing. The problem with buying security things. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, all right. So first of all, we've, I have a lot of thinking to do before, before we do the project definition document. So this is actually great timing that we're doing this, um, episode. What, what are some of the challenges that you run into when you're talking with clients, right? So you have a potential client there. I mean, you get, take a medium-sized healthcare system, right? Like sure. they have some internal testers, but just the sheer amount of internally developed applications, you know, there's just not enough time in the day for even two awesome pen testers to possibly do, you know, a meaningful rounds of pen testing for every single application. If you have 45 applications, right? So what do you, what do you say to that potential customer the, the power of doing it the way that you're talking about. Yeah, ultimately the power from designing and architecting a, a security program effectively allows you to make security almost become invisible because security just becomes part of your regular workflow. So when we talk to our clients, often a big challenge we hear about is we just don't have enough people in house or we have people in house, but we don't have the right expertise. It's really hard to get people who know how to actually test devices or know how to actually pull a firmware off a piece of hardware. 
and and reverse engineer it or or make it misbehave. So that's the most common complaint we hear and the challenge we hear from our customers is that we just don't have the right technical expertise. And building that right technical expertise in-house is extremely challenging, especially, when you, especially <laughs> when you think about the fact that when you train somebody up and they start adding different things on their resume that look very appealing and is rare to find, they almost immediately get another job offer where they're being paid more and you have to start that process all over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to work with our clients to help them understand and find that right balance of what they need to build in-house versus what they need to outsource to the appropriate uh, vendors or to the appropriate providers to be able to make sure that they are a well-rounded enough program that's getting the right coverage. So that becomes the fine balance that ends up needing a lot of discussion. And ultimately, it, it becomes more about the value and the timeliness of being able to provide a specific service that may be in demand. You know, you may need an IoT pen test that has to be done within a week, but if the vendor or provider you're working with says, hey, we need three months lead time before we can start it, that's probably not ever going to happen or work, right? But if if you're able to find a partner where you can work together, truly forecast and plan for activities coming down the line, you can then build a strong partnership and leverage strengths that the different providers have and supplement them with your internal team's capabilities as well. You bring up a huge, huge point because I think a lot of companies in this day and age of sell, sell, sell at all cost, right? I It brings me back to the, my development days. I remember, I can't remember the name of the web development company, but there was a company out of the UK where they had a, they had a client vetting process, right? They didn't just take any client. Like they wanted clients to your point that where they were going to have a relationship that they were going to be co-collabor co-collaborators on and write and companies that were going to value their opinion. And then the trade-off for that is, is the companies that worked with them knew they were getting quality products. Is that, and again, you, you might have to be loose or generic with your response because we don't want your sales team freaking out. But I mean, I see a lot of value in that. Are you guys willing to say no to customers that can't, that don't really buy into what you're trying to say? There, there have been cases in my career and it's not all at NetSpy. I've had, I've been doing cybersecurity work for, you know, 16 plus years now. And you know, there have been times where I've had to walk out of the room from a client meeting and tell the client that it was not the right fit. And it's really hard to do when the dollar amount is really high and you have a quota to meet and you have certain expectations from your leadership team. But ultimately, if you're not able to filter out what the right fit is and do that early on, you end up wasting not only your time, but also your customer's time. And time is money, you know, time is irreplaceable, you know, mm -hmm. so, so being able to look at a problem and understand whether it's part of your core competency or something you can solve or not early, and then either politely bowing out or taking it on as a, as a challenge, um, that needs to happen really quickly. And I think it's part of the consultative sales process. You don't often see this um, as directly when you're selling just a product. So if you're a company, let's talk about this. If you're an Apple and you're selling iPhones and iPads and a customer comes to you and says, hey, I need a screen for my airplane controller, Apple's going to say, we don't make that and walk away. It's just very obvious when it comes to products. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit mm -hmm. more nebulous and gray when it comes to services. services. So that's why having a strong sales team that understands that consultative sales approach tries to very quickly understand what the customer's 
need is and the problem is that they're trying to solve and be able to come up with a solution, that's what typically makes you successful or unsuccessful very quickly. Powerful stuff. I didn't realize I was going to get so deep <laughs> that we were going to get so deep. But no, I mean, every yes, 100% to everything you're saying. That's powerful, powerful stuff. Um, one of the other topics that I wanted to talk about is in regards to attack service management is targeting your ransomware readiness. And some people are going to be like, what does that have to do with like pen testing and other, you know, software development lifecycle? To which you actually have a great reason why it's relevant. So can you can you can you do a little deeper dive into that? Absolutely would love to. So if you think about ransomware and and how organizations get infected with ransomware, it's ultimately a breakdown in a security control or a lack of a security control that allows an attacker to get control of your systems and potentially encrypt or lock it down and, and hold it for ransom. So we talked about buying security things. We often find organizations love to buy a lot of security things. And I always air quotes like security things. <laughs> um, they buy firewalls, they buy static analysis tools, right? They buy developer tools, they buy um, IDSs, and they buy load balancers, and so on and so forth. They just love to buy things to solve a certain problem that they have. But what they often forget to do, because maybe the salesperson who sold it to them says, hey, just turn it on, it will solve world hunger. <laughs> so, the, so the organization turns it on and thinks it solves world hunger for them. <laughs> but what ends up happening is you have all these solutions that get deployed in an organization, but they may not be configured correctly. They may not have the right context. In fact, we often find that when we do our breach and attack simulation engagements, that our customers have many different systems that they expect to behave in a certain way to protect against certain attacks, but usually they're misconfigured or in many cases, their security rules have been turned off because and while effective. the rules were turned on, something didn't work and someone turned it off and it started working again and they never went back to revisit it. So it's <laughs> I've never heard of that. I've it's never a, heard of that. <laughs> it's a very common thing we run into all the time. And um, that's where our breach and attack simulation and our ransom readiness type of offerings really come into play because from the pen testing side, we have deep knowledge and the red teaming side, we have deep knowledge on how attackers compromise systems. And then from the breach and attack simulation side, we look at your internal controls and technologies that you've deployed that are supposed to either detect or prevent certain issues from happening. And we come in and test their effectiveness. So we, we work in a very collaborative manner. We introduce an agent to see how certain TTPs would make your environment behave. And then- Oh, an acronym, sorry. Yes. <laughs> we've, been, we've been chatting so much, I forgot to get caught up in acronyms. Uh, TTP for the listeners. TTP is uh, Threats, Tactics, and Procedures, I believe. If I'm wrong, we'll have to edit this and, and fix it. <laughs> um, but I believe that's what they are. They're basically the techniques that uh, threat actors use to uh, compromise systems. So for example, if you find uh, different you know, uh, persistent threats that are trying to attack you in a certain way, they'll have their own class of TTPs uh, and we can categorize them and see patterns and how they're attacking different systems. So what, um, what happens in breach and attack simulation is we can now come in and evaluate your effectiveness of what controls you have find gaps, determine, you know, how hard do you need to push at a system until it falls over mm -hmm. and, and then come up with a plan on how to have a, a multi-layered approach uh, to security to make sure that that doesn't end up compromising you in some way. So you can actually look at various different categories of technologies and domains of cybersecurity practice and see what type of controls you have and how effective they are in protecting you and, and what they're supposed to do. That sounds like, does it, so with those, can you 
then set up tabletop exercises with your lead, with your non-security leadership because I think there'd be value in that, right? So you've you've done discovery, you could then go over different things because in the end, like you said, the CISO, well, you understand this is a CISO, like your your power only goes to a certain level, right? In the end, there's still people above you that have to make critical decisions based on the information that you've shared. Could could you set up tabletops after that? It's it's a very common next step we see in, in this process. You know, cybersecurity executives may have an understanding for the impact and the challenges, but the broader executive leadership, senior management, and key stakeholders in the process may not understand the implications. So if you know how strong or weak your detective capabilities are, you can then try to find ways to get in or create a compromise and come up with a scenario and perform a tabletop activity to understand what the gaps are, use that to educate the team on, on what would happen and, and how uh, effective your organization's um, standards and policies are from a governance perspective to be able to protect you in that scenario. And also get buy-in that you actually need focus in this area and that it could actually have a pretty catastrophic impact. Maybe it's a reputational brand damage. You know, how do you assign the cost of, um, you know, some sort of a reputational damage um, and determine what type of implications they would have and then decide on whether it be budgeting, resourcing, planning, et cetera, from the cybersecurity perspective. That's, that's, well, you're just making me do a lot of thinking today. I was not, pre- I was not prepared for this. I would have had a lot more coffee. I, know I, I live and breathe thinking. this every day. You know, I, <laughs> I, if you can't tell, I'm passionate about this, and I love. No, that, that's so. it, it's wonderful. Um, we're we're starting to run up against the time limit here, so I want to go over a couple of things. But I, I just want to finish on that note to where um, some of the college, as bad luck would have it, or good luck, depending on if you're intimidated by high high leadership which I'm not, unfortunately, um, being in some of those exercises, it's been interesting to see where you tell a, 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 a VP of facilities, right? Or even higher, like, okay, in this scenario, you're used to brownouts, right? Because a lot of, a lot of these, a lot of facilities leaders will come into some of these tabletops and they're like, all right, we got this because we do a brownout, right? We do a down test it. We've lost power at this location. We're going to shift to backup generators and, you know, they, that business continuity, which is wonderful, but it's those little weird idiosyncrasies that you pick up to, you can throw them off saying, okay, now we have a situation where you got partial power here. And then this bad guy just took your backup plan offline now what do you do right and that's interesting because those are the decisions that kind of stops in their tracks for a little bit and then they have to think back to the different buildings to say wow okay for these types of procedures we can't have them go to the main clinic anymore but this satellite office could do this right so we'd route the hospital how route the ambulances there it's it's really interesting when you get in some of those exercises for them to start seeing, you know, they're thinking like a reverse hacker, right? Okay, if they did this, it's that check, not check, uh, chess, you know, that kind of that chess match. Okay, all right. I need to talk about uh, the charity that we're working with. So in the month of June, we're doing Latinas in Cyber. So this is the last sponsored episode where we're raising money for Latinas in Cyber, which is helping um, young Latino women or Latin X. I always get see it's the problem with being getting older, right? Is I'm not I'm not up to date like on all the different terminology, but we're gonna help some awesome young ladies get into STEAM and STEM. Um, with some scholarships and stuff. So thank you very much to NetSpy for helping raise uh, money for charity on that. Now, since I don't have Tom, since he he left us, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot for doing the sales pitch part, right? Which you kind of already did throughout this episode. Um, in two minutes, uh, why would a comp- why would a major healthcare system want to spend 30 minutes talking to you about how your company can help us be more secure? 
I did not expect to be put on the spot like this. Oh, so let, well, me, let me work. Let me work. Wait, my, wait, my we don't pitch. have to. We let can me, edit that. Let, huh? me, let me harness my inner Tom and and give you the the elevator pitch for NetSpy. So <laughs> so NetSpy, we are a leader in offensive security testing. And the thing that sets us apart from other organizations who also do offensive security is our focus on people. So we are technology and platform enabled, but we're human delivered. So we've spent a lot of time and effort in building uh, a cybersecurity platform that enables our testers to be significantly more effective and consistent across the board. So our technology is what enables our, our testers. We have consolidated checklists. We have consistent reporting. We have vulnerability deduplication and correlation that are all taken care of by the platform so our testers can truly focus on finding manual, critical, business-level vulnerabilities that truly have an impact versus just running automated tools and scans. So we come in and bring that type of expertise. We have over 250 testers. Our company is 500 plus, but we you have over that. 250 testers with very spe various different specializations in different domains, ranging from web application to IoT slash ATM, uh, automotive, medical devices. We do a lot of medical device testing. Um, and then, of course, cloud is another big one. If you can imagine, we've come a long way from having backups on your CD that sits on the same desk as your desktop to now having cloud uh, services that can help you do various things in a matter of seconds. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, focus and, and growth in the cloud space as well. And lastly, we also sell certain products. And the products are things like attack surface management solution, which is a 24-7, 365 days a year service that works as a service to give you a current view of your attack surface and solutions like breach and attack simulation that you can leverage to regularly test the effectiveness of different security controls that you might have in the organization. I think you did pretty damn good. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask Tom for some commission money. After this. Yeah, I was going to say, Tom, you, he, I was going to say, he just gave you a run for your money. In all seriousness, no, thank you again for this conversation. Um, again, I didn't really think I was going to be, have to think so deeply today, but Nabil, you, you, you challenged me on a lot of things and I very much appreciate it. Um, so thanks again for helping with charity and thank you again for being a guest. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure.